Um, it's so great to see so many of you here today. I'm just looking at our register. Um, it's a fantastic turnout. Uh, I know the content of today's webinar will resonate massively. Starting to sort of navigate our way slowly out of lockdown. Um, and I guess the uh, forced inertia really that businesses have found themselves in. So with that in mind, um, let's get cracking. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the webinar environment, look at the webinar controls. Um, you can select audio settings to select and test your speakers because you don't want to be missing out on my dulcet tones. Um, and if you want to submit any questions uh, via the question and answer button, just feel free to type those in at any point. Um, we're going to try to answer your questions at the end of the webinar. And if you need to leave the meeting um, at any time, uh, just click leave meeting. So that's most of the, the techie sort of info outlined there. Um, and I'm going to introduce today's presenter, uh, Steve Price, who is director here at Inspire. So without any further ado, welcome to Steve. OK, thanks very much, Jenny. And thank you, everybody, for uh, for joining us today and giving us your uh, your valuable time. I hope we can share some real value with you over the course of the next 45 minutes or so. So before I start, let's get right to the point. I want to reflect on the situation we currently find ourselves in. Some of us can be facing the potential loss of our business and possibly even our livelihoods. Success in 2021 is likely to look very different to how we may have been defining success at the beginning of last year, at the beginning of 2020. But equal, equally, failure is, an, is, is something that we should embrace too, because we all know we can learn from our mistakes. So in the words of JFK, a rising tide lifts all boats. The more we support each other, the better we're all going to do. So at Inspire, one of our core values is to make an impact and it's what we're constantly trying to do and that's what we're playing into right here we're here today jenny and myself to offer you that support and we want to help okay so before i get stuck in i want to just throw in our usual disclaimer that this information is just for education it's it's general in its nature and you mustn't see this as a substitute for any tailored advice which might be specific to your particular circumstances. Obviously, you know where we are if you do need that. Hopefully, we are going to be able to uh, shed some education though here this morning. So today we're going to look at some of the challenges you might be faced that you might be faced with and the mindset you're going to need to overcome them. So then we're going to help you focus on what you can control in particular key areas of your business that will help you mitigate risk and get the best outcomes for your business. So this is going to include your product or perhaps even service mix, your marketing and communication, your human resources, finance, and also how you can plan to get your, your business on the best footing for 2021 and beyond. So I think it's worth acknowledging that the last year has obviously been extremely challenging. And for some of you, the biggest challenge you face is whether your business is even going to survive. I hope that by the end of this webinar, you're going to feel confident about the steps you can take to give your business the best chance of survival and possibly even growth. The needs for every business right now Will be different but there are likely to be some common themes and challenges and we can use to these to form our goals for the next year so the types of challenges that you might be facing include as the list on the screen shows the new break-even level that you need to achieve do you know what that was do you know what that is do you know what that needs to be the changes you need to make to your product or service mix are there changes you've already made or should be making? The HR changes you might need to make. So, for example, hiring new team members or even outs outsourcing some of your tasks. As always, the government support that may be available. There's not as much of it around as there was a year ago, but it is still there. And that can get you back on track in your business. 
how you can get better deals with suppliers when they're also suffering and how to prepare, hopefully not, but potentially for another lockdown. Overcoming these challenges might not be easy. If it was easy, you probably would have done it right by now. So it's key to set aside time to work on your business and develop your strategy for getting back to business. Okay, so one of the first steps you can take is to develop or possibly update your risk register. And that's going to help you profile your risks and establish your focus. Your risk register should identify the risks within each department in the business and evaluate the likelihood of the risk eventuating and the consequences for your business if in fact it, it, does, um, it does eventuate. By allocating a score out of five for each, you can multiply them to establish an overall risk rating, highlighting the most significant risks for you to focus on. So if you don't know what I'm talking about, or if indeed you don't have a risk register, then there's a template that we can give you. Towards the end of this webinar, there's quite a lot that we're going to be able to give away today. A lot of what we're going to be showing you, we are able to give away as resources. And this is the first one here, a risk rest. A risk register is something we um, we wholly advocate and we can provide a template for you. OK, so I know I'm most likely preaching to the converted here when I talk about embracing change. I mean, after all, you've been dealing with change for at least the last 12 months, possibly more. So I want to share with you a couple of mindsets relating to change to ensure you don't take your foot off the change accelerator just yet. I'm sure you've all heard of Einstein's famous definition of insanity, and that's doing the same thing over and over again and yet expecting a different result. Now is clearly the time to do some things different. So let's have a look at these five A's of change. So the first step is awareness. It's awareness that change is needed and that without that change, your business is going to be impacted. Are you aware of all of the necessary changes? Probably not. We don't know what we don't know, right? Hopefully, by the end of today's webinar, you'll be a bit clearer on some of the changes you need to implement. Okay. So the second A is that of acceptance. To get back to business, we must accept that will need to make the changes. The next one is action. Without action, there will be no change. I think that's probably quite obvious. We must determine the actions we need to take as part of the plan for getting back to business. If you're anything like me, awareness, acceptance and action is not going to be enough though. We may have the best of intentions, but things get in the way day to day if we don't make the time to take those actions. So, the fourth A is for accountability. We need somebody independent to check in with us, to keep our plan up to date and make sure that we do actually act, that we do take action. And of course, any of our clients who work with me will know this is the one I always stress as the key stage. This is the one that really makes things happen. And the fifth A, is acknowledgement. Change isn't easy. So if we acknowledge and celebrate the changes we're making, no matter big, how big or small they are, it's more likely that, we, that we'll maintain the actions and changes in the future so we can gather momentum. <coughs> Excuse me. The next mindset that, that will help us keep the change accelerator on is the results mindset. We know that we can't keep doing what we've always done if we want different results. So how do we ensure that we get the results we want? Well, first, we have to decide what we're going to do. We need to distill our thoughts and our ideas and our plans. And really, we want to come out with four to five key goals for the year. If we do many more than that, we do stand the risk of overwhelm. So it's important to have decisions, but it's also important to distill them or refine them down to key decisions and tasks that we need to do. Then once we've got that list for each of those goals, we need to break them down into individual actions that we can then take to ensure we achieve them. These goals and actions 
form the basis of what is basically our plan, our business plan. And then going back to the fourth A of change, unless we have some degree of accountability, it's likely that other things are going to get in the way and the plan won't become a reality. Having somebody independent hold you to account will make sure the plan is actioned. So look, it's simple. There's only three components. And these three components are essential to achieving your desired results. In other words, the power of your plan is all there in the implementation. So as we embrace and we set our new plan, we need to get very clear on our focus. What are the areas which are within our control and will have the greatest impact on our results? We also need to consider things that we should stop doing so that we can free up our time to do these new things. Because what we can say yes to is defined by what we say no to. Let me just say that once more. What we can say yes to is defined by what we say no to. How many of us are guilty of never saying no? Saying yes to everybody. All good intentions, but ultimately somebody gets let down. What we can say yes to is defined by what we say no to. That's a huge mindset there. And the reason I stress that so much is it's one I constantly try and remind myself because it's something I'm very definitely guilty of. So to help get back to business, there are five key areas which are likely to have the biggest impact. So let's work through this list. Firstly, working on the business because it's essential that you take time out of working in the business to work on it. We've talked about this many times before. Next, reviewing your product or service mix to respond to the changing needs of your customers. We must also consider marketing and communication. So do you have a plan for communicating that you're back in business? Can you attract a different sector of the market perhaps? Okay, so what about human resources? What are your resourcing gaps? Do you need to recruit new team members? Are you perhaps over-resourced in any areas? And lastly, we'll look at finance. Obviously, finance, profitability and cash flow, all good accounting things. This is about your personal budget as well as your business budget. What changes do you need to make to your budgets? What bank and government support do you perhaps need? OK, so we're going to go into these five areas in more detail, one by one. So let's talk about working on the business. There are lots of cliches about working on the business, but what does it actually mean? Well, working on your business is when you take time out of your day and focus on your planning. It's so easy to get bogged down in daily tasks and forget to concentrate on what you want your future to look like. Without a plan, you don't have any clear understanding of what you want to achieve. And once you've set that plan, you need to review and update it regularly. Your best efforts setting the plan today aren't worth aren't worth a bean, aren't worth anything if you never look at it again. So you need to set aside time to document your plan and then, most crucially, regularly set time aside to ensure you're still on track. Mm -hmm. Now, as a leader, there are key habits you need to develop to ensure you have the best chance of success. Firstly, dedicating time to work on the business regularly. We've just been speaking about that. Secondly, keeping the plan up to date. That's related to the first one. Taking time outside of the business for your own well-being. I'm not the first person to ever mention that to you, but how many of us actually do it? How many of us actually take time to do it? Staying positive and what we call above the line. So in other words, focusing on what we can control rather than worrying about what we can't. And then finally, measuring the right things and taking time to look at our numbers. Again, I'll ask you the same question. How many of us actually do it? We always recommend as best practice that our clients have three essentials, an annual business plan, 
an annual forecast, and then with those, the ongoing reporting and accountability. I know there's people on this webinar today who I work with very closely in doing exactly those three things. So I'm, hope, I'm hoping I've got some, some nodding heads there to that point. A plan is essential to set the direction of your business. A forecast is essential to stay on top of your cash flow. An ongoing reporting allows you to monitor your progress against that plan. It's accountability that can be the difference between achieving those goals or not achieving them. So, think broadly about how each department needs to respond to getting back to business. I have shown this diagram before in previous um, webinars, but there's quite a lot of detail in it. At Inspire, we've spent a lot of time and given a huge amount of focus on this over the past few months. And today we're going to focus on the four which are likely to be relevant to all of you, but there may be other departments which are equally important for you. So this talks about the 10 departments, this, this, this diagram on screen now talks about the 10 departments, no matter what you do, what industry you're in, how your business is structured, all businesses will have these 10 departments. If you're a one man band, sole trader, whatever you want to describe it as, you will wear every single hat. The functions themselves still exist. We're going to have a look at four of the key areas. So let's have a look at the product service mix. Perhaps the biggest area of opportunity in the current climate is to review your products or service mix. I'm sure you've already thought about changes you can make to your products or services. Things like diversifying your offering, moving online if you haven't already, or focusing on a different set of customers. Again, at Inspire, let me talk to you about something we're doing. We are um, preparing to launch various new services as we all get back to business. These, we hope, will help, will, are going to further help our existing and new clients as we enter the new normal. And I'm really looking forward to announcing these in the very near future. We've, a lot of work has gone into these behind the scenes and it's something that we're getting very close to be able to launch in right now. So what I want to show you with you now, so that perhaps you can start to enter this way of thinking as well, is a useful framework for you to make a plan for adapting your product or perhaps your service mix. And this is called the ANSOF matrix. Of course, it's something that's you may have come across before in textbooks or, um, or other online learning. Um, but it's really useful to help you determine your marketing strategy and understand the risks when expanding your, your offering. So there's that word again, risk. We need to understand what it is, what it might be. So this framework shows four strategies for growth based on new and existing markets and products. So the first strategy is market penetration. This means selling more of your existing products in your existing markets. There are so many ways to do this. So, for example, communicating more with your customers so they're aware of your full offering. Training your team to cross sell or even upsell or starting a loyalty program to encourage customers to buy from you more often. This one here, market penetration, is the lowest risk and most cost effective strategy. And I'm sure to some extent you're doing you're doing some element of this as we speak. Next, it's a matter of choosing to develop a new product to sell in your existing market or sell your existing product in a new market. So let's have a look at those. If you choose product development, think about either enhancing your current products or services to add more value or developing entirely new products or services. You could go down the other route. You could choose market development. And this is where you can expand geographically by opening in new locations or targeting new segments. And of course, if we're going to talk about going online, then that hope opens up a whole new dimension to that as well. And then the final strategy, diversification. So this one now involves both new products and new markets. I'm going to be honest with you here of the four. This is by far the most risky. And right now, I would ask you to seriously question whether that's a sensible strategy in times of such uncertainty. 
take very uh, great care over full diversification. The first three quadrants really are um, where, where, where I would personally be putting my full attention or, or, or at least my, um, my uh, priority attention. What's important is to avoid trying to take on too much at once. So start with just one or two strategies, which will help you sell more of your existing products to your existing markets. And of course, that's all about market penetration. So as part of your review of your products or service mix, you're likely to review your pricing. You may be tempted to discount your prices, hoping this will result in more sales and an increase in gross margin or you might consider increasing your prices as a way to grow your revenue. Before changing your prices, you must understand the impact it's gonna have. Let's have a look at that then. So for example, if your gross margin is 30% highlighted on this table here, and you discount your price by 10%, you'd need to increase your sales by 50% to keep the same profit level. Just consider that for a second. You're running at a 30% margin and you quite easily say, okay, let's go for a 10% discount. Sounds fine, doesn't it? Sounds fair, 10% discount, yeah, okay. In order to maintain overall revenue, you then need to go out and increase your sales by a whopping 50% just to keep the same profit level. Let's have a look at this the other way around. If you choose to increase your price by 10% at the same gross margin, now you can afford to reduce your sales volume by 25% before your gross margin will reduce. So look at, the look at the power of price increases. If we're debating whether to increase our prices, again, at that same margin level of 30%, if we increase prices by 10, we know that we might not make as many sales, but we can afford a 25% drop off. Right now, I know you're looking at this table and you're looking at where your margin sits and where your figures will be. So what I'll say is if you want these tables after the webinar, we'll send them over to you so you can establish your pricing levels. At the end, at the end, anybody who's been on our webinars before will know this. We take you to a screen. Uh, there's a very short survey there and there is a tick box. If you just tick that, drop us your email address, we'll get these tables over to you. Um, that, and, that and a few other things, as I've already said. And also, if you're unsure as to what your gross margin is, so this is all OK, Steve, this is great. But actually, I don't know which column to look at because I'm not sure of your margin. Well, that's really something you should know. And of course, you know where we are. I'd be more than happy to talk through that with you, talking about your numbers and understanding what your present gross margin is. Okay, let's turn to the next one. There has never been a more important time to get clear on your marketing and communication strategy. One thing's for sure, your loyal customers will be eager to support you as you get back to business and there lies an opportunity for you to broaden your customer base. By clearly communicating your intentions across multiple channels, your advocates can like, tag, share, or whatever, but basically show their support for you online. Start by crafting your message, which above all else should be clear. From a health perspective, reassure your customers and your own team that you've taken necessary safety measures to keep them safe. Explain how you'll manage you know, physical distancing, safe payment processes, cleaning, etc. A year ago, we knew nothing of this and now it almost feels like old hat to us. Next, it's important to clarify any changes in opening hours or perhaps your operations and then promote any new products or services as we've just been discussing into that mix. Communicate these key messages in the right places. They should be promoted on your website, across social media channels, um, on your Google Places listing, and of course, at your physical premises. Don't assume your customers will go looking for this information in the same place. A potential customer 
may need to see your messaging a couple of times before they actually get to start speaking to you. It's about relaying key information, managing expectations and inviting feedback. Now is a fabulous time to try something new in the marketing space as there's empathy and appreciation for businesses adapting in challenging times. And I know so many of you are doing this, the conversations which we've had and the efforts that we've, we've seen from talking to our clients is phenomenal. Use regular touch points to reiterate the safety message. Practice what you preach. Demonstrate your safety measures to keep customers' anxieties low. Craft a unified message to keep your audience updated and anticipate any questions you may get. So even go as far as scripting responses for your team so that they can con convey a clear and consistent message. And of course, this is going to be key for maintaining customer trust, restoring your employee morale and returning to any form of normal. All messaging should be timely, relevant, empathetic and considerate of customer needs and challenges. OK, so once you're clear on your messaging, it's time then to document your plan for how you're actually going to get that message across. Get back to basics. Consider who your most profitable customers are and how you're going to target them. What specific marketing personas or, or avatars, as we sometimes call them, do you want to be marketing to? Create a clear plan to deliver visually engaging content across your marketing channels to promote awareness of your offering. Consider ways to get your communications to stand out above the noise. Get creative and consider new promotions. Perhaps it's time to celebrate customers who were loyal to you during the crisis or deliver co-marketing with other, other businesses who might not be in your, um, in your competitive space. But whatever your strategy, stick to your brand values. Put yourself in your customer's shoes and make it easy for them to do business with you. This is the very essence of marketing. This is what it all should be centered around. Seek to enjoy some quick wins. Marketing is about momentum, which starts with a few simple activities. Let's talk about HR. It's another hugely important consideration. I think you probably already know that. Your plan should assess your current HR needs. Can you afford to keep all of the existing team on board? With your change product or service mix, do you need to recruit new people? You'll need to clarify your desired structure before looking for new employees. You should shape your new roles based upon what the business needs rather than attempting to shape existing people into new roles. Having the wrong person in a role can be very damaging in the long run, both for you, for them, well, and your business as well. Assessing your HR needs within each of the 10 departments we showed before in the diagram within your business is a great way to future proof your organization structure. OK, so let's think about your business as a bus. OK, you're driving a bus. You are the driver as the business leader. You are the driver and your team members are the passengers. OK, close your eyes and picture that for a second. Who's currently on it? Who is definitely along for the ride and who perhaps needs to get off at the next stop? Perhaps your bus was a double decker, but needs to be downgraded to a mini mini bus in order to survive. Perhaps you need to consider an outsourcing model to induce additional flexibility. So at the moment, we're seeing a lot of business, more businesses um, embrace outsourcing in their marketing, their IT. And guess what? More and more, we're seeing this creep into our area as well, accounting. In fact, we're now working very closely with a number of our clients who have seen us inspire as a means of outsourcing their accounts department to either reduce cost or perhaps increase flexibility. So you may have already reduced the size of your team significantly and now need to recruit to keep the, the business moving, the bus, the business, whatever. There may be government support available to help with this. So a great example here is the kickstart scheme. 
Now, this provides a fantastic, very low cost or, uh, and possibly even no cost opportunity to recruit young people aged 25 or under. There's another one as well, the training levy, which is levied on larger companies and used to hand back to smaller companies, can also create further training opportunities with savings as high as 90%. Either way, every business should be reviewing their HR needs and ensuring that their bus is the right size with the right passengers on board and that together you're in the best possible space to support each other to perform. Let's talk about the team well-being. The healthy mind platter, which is on screen, is a great concept to keep front of mind in challenging times to ensure you're looking after, looking after your team's well-being. And remember that you're part of that team as well, so you need to look out for your own well-being too. Let's have a look at the healthy mind platter. It's made up of seven activities. And the idea is that we should try to do each of these seven activities daily to support a healthy mind. So we need physical time. Obviously, that's about exercising or at least moving our bodies. Downtime or chilling out where we intentionally let our minds wander. Perhaps this is about listening to music or, uh, or, or reading or something, whatever, whatever is preferable for yourself. What about playtime where we do something fun? So this can be something as simple as playing with your children or if you don't have any, perhaps acting like a child every now and then. Sleep time is an obvious one, but it's crucial. And we need to remind ourselves of the importance of getting six, maybe eight hours of quality sleep every night. Everyone's different, but do you know how much sleep you need? Time in. This is spending time reflecting inward. This may be journaling your thoughts. Perhaps it might be meditation or yoga. It's getting more and more popular and there's various online options through which you can do it. I'll admit to you all now, it's something I do occasionally, but no, I should do more. Focus time. This is focusing on one thing with discipline. And lastly, connecting time is essential. For most of us, this means connecting with other people. And we are finally starting to get to a place where this simple pleasure is possible again now after what seems like an awfully long time. The winter, long, the winter lockdown, it just feels like has been so much lo longer than the summer one. Don't be overwhelmed by these seven activities. Even just five to 10 minutes a day of each one will help you maintain a healthier mind. And some things you will need to do tick several boxes. So for example, if you're gonna play with your kids, maybe outside, then that's, then that's creating you know, connection time and it's creating physical time at the same time. It doesn't need to be 70 minutes of, um, of, of, of ticking all these seven things off individually. So let's talk about your team. What are you currently doing to support your team's well-being? And what could you start doing? We recommend talking with your team about how they're coping. A great way to understand their well-being needs is to do a team reflection survey. So let's talk about Inspire for a second. Last week, um, we held a very informal team event just to get us all engaged in something together other than work. So we held it online, obviously, but it offered just a just a small bit of respite. I know some of the team will be listening um, on, on this uh, webinar today and we will be doing our our own well-being survey. Um, I expect next week, certainly in the next two weeks. So we've created a template for this and to everybody on this webinar today, it's a template we're happy to share with you. By reflecting on your team's experiences over the last 12 months, you'll be better equipped to support them and ensure they're in the right frame of mind to be productive in the future. So all about what we've taught so far will have an impact on your finance. It's going to have an impact on your profitability and on your cash flow. It's important to get the order right here. So start off with your personal circumstances and determine your personal budget for the next 12 months. And then, only then, do your business budget and see if your personal budget is achievable given the business's cash flow and profit forecast. 
what I'm saying here, here is, can your business afford to keep the budget that you expect to need in your own life? That connection is vitally important to you. So let's look at these aspects in more detail. The first step is improving cash flow and reducing the stress and the strain on your business is to review your personal budget. What different spending habits have you adopted recently? That should carry on. What old habits or costs can you eliminate? We've got a great personal budgeting template we can share with you. And again, I'll just say another time, you can um, select that off the um, survey at the end of this webinar. And um, if you do, we'll get that sent across to you. So then you're gonna update this person, sorry, then you're gonna update the business budget. This is a more complicated exercise as it pulls together the different scenarios you're planning. For example, if you're going to introduce a new product or a new service, you need to project as best you can what the predicted sales will be and what the predicted costs will be. Different marketing and communication decisions will also have an impact on business cash flow, as will your HR decisions. Your business budget then becomes an iterative process that will need constant review and updating. So you can work with us. We can factor in some of the more complex aspects like the tax, um, any grants you might be able to get, obviously um, the, the, the implication and the interest costs of any bank finance, what the implications of any capital expenditure might be. And we can also help you with managing your cash flow off the back of that. So if you struggled with cash flow in your business, it will come down to one of one or more of these seven causes of poor cash flow. Having a close look at these as part of your planning will be essential. So let's go ahead and have a look at each one. The seven poor, the seven causes of poor cash flow. So the first is your accounts receivable or your or your or your debtors process. Credit control, call it what you will. Who do you give credit to? What payment options do you give them? And what do you do if they don't pay? If you could reduce the number of days your debtors take to pay you by, let's say, 10 days on average, how much cash would that put into your bank account? It's a calculation which we can help you with. The second, the second part, possibly, obviously, it's the flip side. It's the accounts payable or the creditors process. What controls do you have um, about how you spend money? Can you get a better deal with any of your suppliers? And the next one is your stock process. Do you need to hold so much stock? What lines of stock should you no longer supply? What controls do you have on ordering? Having an appropriate, sorry, having an inappropriate debt or capital structure can cripple your cash flow. For example, even though interest rates are generally low right now, should part of your overdraft or your credit card debt be converted to a longer term loan? Should you sell other investments to repay debt in your business? Number five, overheads are the costs, which of course don't change based upon your sales level. Things like, you know, utilities, rent, maybe advertising, you should be reviewing these costs at least annually. Can a different utility company provide a better deal? Are your premises still the right size for your business? These are the questions you need to be asking. Number six, your gross profit margin is what's left from sales after, deduct, after deducting the variable costs. So what can you do to increase your margin? Can you reduce any wastage or inefficiency in the system? Can you improve your productivity? Can you increase your prices? We talked about that earlier on. That's a very quick win towards um, improving your gross margin. And remember, obviously from the table we looked at earlier, we can start to quantify how, that, how those um, impacts can go through. And then finally, number seven, your sales level might be too low, especially due to the, any sort of COVID impacts that have come or lockdown impacts over the last year or so. So, we need to look at different ways you can grow sales. And we're going to be doing that next. This list might be overwhelming, but you simply need to pick one or two off the list and focus on these strategies. The key is in their implementation. Small changes to these processes can have a huge impact on your cash flow. 
We can help you establish the ones most relevant to your business, as well as share ideas for improvement. So let's just very quickly have a look at those routes into growth then, because um, this is one of the key areas we can, we can improve our business and our cash flow at the same time. So we've got seven ways to grow your business. The first five all relate to increasing sales. Remember, we just saw that low sales levels were a key to a cause of this poor cash flow. And then the last two I'm gonna cover as part of the seven relate to reducing your expenses. Now you may not think you're in a place to grow your business right now, but these strategies are so important for getting back to business and recovering as much as possible. So the first is to increase your customer retention rate. This is always going to be number one. What can you do to delight your customers and make them want to return to you? Do you know what is your cost, what it is your, your customers want? What is your current communication strategy with your customers? Everybody knows it's a very old tried and tested adage that it is easier to keep current clients than it is to go out and win new ones. The second one is to generate more leads or attract more prospective customers. Reflecting on what we've discussed today, what can you do to get your brand and business in front of more target customers? The third is to convert those leads into customers. What can you do to increase that conversion rate? Number four is to increase the transaction value or perhaps um, to get your customers to buy from you more often. What, are that, what additional opportunities to sell? What additional opportunities are there to sell to your customers here? And five, I've, I've, I'm sorry, I've covered four and five in the same one. So we talk about increasing individual transaction value and then increasing the number of transactions as well. And together, obviously they can contribute to overall um, increase of sales revenue. Number six, I said the last two were about reducing um, expenses. Number six is reducing the cost of sales or the variable cost of in your business. Can you get better supplier terms? Can you increase your efficiency or perhaps reduce wastage? And finally, number seven is to reduce the overheads. These are the fixed costs in the business. We've just looked at having um, at doing that in the previous slide regarding um, cash flow. What review can you take and what reductions can you make? Once again, it's best to choose just one or two of these strategies and then really go for it, really implement them and understand which of these will have the greatest impact on your own business. Of course, we can get involved. We can help you assess. We can assess, help you assess these. We can analyze the figures for you and try to understand the strategy that will have the greatest impact. Okay, so here's an example of what that plan might look like. This, what I'm sharing with you now, is an example of our business recovery plan. However, just a standard business plan or even a marketing plan may be more appropriate for some of you, depending on where your business is at. What matters is that you document your plan with clear goals and actions and have some accountability to make sure you get it done. So this plan starts with a summary of the key challenges which will help formulate the rest of the plan. Next, we record the new opportunities that exist as well as the threats and the vulnerabilities that might need to be managed. Then we have our most critical KPIs to achieve the five most important habits to maintain or ensure that our business recovers. Then we have a summary of our personal spending, our role and our hours of work for the current year and what we want this to look like in three years. This is about business owners being aspirational. It's also a summary of the new finance we might need, and that might include the government support or, or the grants that we might be applicable to. Then we have our annual budget, which we'll review and update each quarter to make sure we're on track. Yeah. And finally, I'm sorry, I clicked too fast.
And finally, we have goals broken down into each department of our business. So for each department, we've identified what we must do differently. Set an annual goal for which we've broken down into 90 day goals and then identified the actions required to achieve those goals. We try to allocate a person responsible for those actions and crucially set a date by which they will be completed by. Our goals all relate to the challenges, the opportunities, the vulnerabilities and the threats and the habits we have identified within our plan. What's really important here is to avoid doing nothing. That's the one major thing you must not do. You're going to be busy as it is, so let's make sure you focus that busyness and your time on the areas that will give you the greatest results. So let's talk about the specific areas of support we can offer, many of which today are free for you. So I want to reiterate just one more time, the information in this um, webinar today is educational, it's general in nature. It's no substitute for tailored advice. So this slide here is about showing you where we can potentially give you that crucial tailored advice where you need it. There's a feedback form at the end of the webinar and you can select all of these, they're all listed. Let me just talk through them for you. We've got the risk register at, 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 the, um, at the top of the list. We showed you that right at the start of this webinar. That's something we can give you for, for free. The personal budget, we've talked about that. We've talked about it in principle. Obviously, there's a lot of detail to look at once you actually um, get your hands on it. The pricing impact tables, these are fascinating. These really do open your eyes once you start to have a look at these and see which numbers are applicable to your business. We've got a back to business action list. That is the very first, um, if you like, um, entry point of starting to create your own plan. So it's not a fully blown plan, but it's a tick list. It's a checklist of things we actually need to make sure we've got on put in place. Most clients who do that action list end up saying, yeah, do you know what? This has opened our eyes now. We realize we need a full plan. And when we get into that full planning stage, if you want our assistance, we of course can provide it. We of course do provide it all the time with different clients. We can do a business recovery plan, which is quite tailored to the current time in the post pandemic period. That's going to cost one, 1,500. But the most successful way to do this is to build it into an annual plan. So we can do a plan. We can give you that full forecast and we can do the accountability coaching and we charge that on a monthly basis. Obviously, we'll talk about things if you'd like to that are specific to you, but to give you some idea of the cost so you can make an educated decision, you're looking at around 285 um, per month on that for, a, for an annual programme. And if you want to talk about any of these things or any of the other things that we've mentioned in today's webinar, then uh, we would be happy to meet you either, either one of us or a member of our colleagues within the wider team at Inspire. We're always happy to talk. Okay, we'd like to know if there's been any questions and I'm going to ask Jenny, who's been hopefully monitoring the questions as they've come in. Oh, I have, I have. Oh, that was, that was fabulous, Steve. So much uh, information there just to sink our teeth into. And uh, I think um, today's content's really captured people's imagination today. So I've got some really great feedback. So thanks for that. Um, but I am just conscious of time. So I will go to Pete um, and Pete's asked, the idea of planning sounds good, it always does, but with things changing all the time, it can also be pointless. Is it really worth spending too much time on something that can quickly become out of date? Okay, sorry, was that Pete? That was Pete, yeah. Okay, Pete, great, great question. And it's one um, we are asked, uh, probably more so right now than, than ever before for obvious reasons. Um, I probably don't need to... Um, to say again the importance which I and the other guys at Inspire place on planning. Um, so I'm going to answer that first and foremost. But your question about, okay, planning in changeable times is, is a valid one, okay? We, we put all our efforts and resources and minds into planning this thing and then tomorrow something changes and it's all in the pot. The key to this, the difference, is having an active plan. Our methodology is very much that we don't just write a plan, write it up, send it across and say, 
good luck with that guys we're going to speak to you in a year's time to see how it all went on it's all it's almost a pointless task um, for the reasons you've just outlined there you need to keep that plan active but you should still have a plan because that plan is there to keep you accountable if you don't have a direction to go in you just wake up every morning and say what are today's challenges and deal with them go to bed get up the next day you turn around after 90 days or maybe a year and say well where did we end up we have no idea where we we're going but let's have a look where we ended up you can't operate a business like that and you particularly can't operate a business like that in 2021 so i would say more than ever is the time to make sure you've got a plan but it has to be an active a fluid a flexible plan Fantastic. i'll come back to the sorry, sorry jenny i'll just i'll just yeah. come back to the idea to that what gets measured gets managed it's a very old saying it's just as applicable in sport as it is in business what gets measured gets managed if you don't have a plan you don't have anything to measure against and your management is immediately diluted but the key to your answer pete and i know this is a long answer the key to your and i think i said this earlier in the implementation the power of any plan is in its implementation not just in writing it out so I hope that answers the difference between a, perhaps a traditional plan and what we're really trying to advocate right now. Brilliant. Sorry, yeah, no problem at all. No, that's that's fantastic. Yeah, I hope that's answered your uh, your question there, Pete. Um, and then we've got one from Amy who's picked up on something that you mentioned earlier on in the webinar, Steve. It's um, how do I find out more about the Kickstart scheme? The Kickstart scheme, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> so this was announced by the government a long time ago, and then it went, went very quiet, very hush-hush, and then they did re-release it. Um, and, and, and to begin with, and this is a key bit of information here, to begin with, they came out with what was <laughs> a somewhat ridiculous notion that in order to use this scheme, you had to take on 30 apprentices all at the same time, which rendered it completely useless to anybody in the small business place. They've since removed that, I'm very glad to say, and the Kickstart scheme is very much up and running. We released one of our keeping in touch emails about this around a month ago, um, possibly six weeks ago now, when, when the new details of the kind of uh, rescheduled scheme came out. Steve Richardson, who puts together our um, keeping in touch um, um emails and newsletters um, did a piece on this if you want to get in contact with us we can resend you this um, but we have clients who are heavily involved in this obviously you, you need to go through the government to actually apply for it we can give you some um, anecdotal advice it's still very new so we wouldn't claim to be experts on it but reach out to us get in touch we can either hook you up with some of our clients or point you in the right direction Fantastic. Great stuff. Um, yeah, I, like I so, a bit conscious of time. So um, I'm just going to go to some fantastic feedback that we've received from, um, from, from Joyce about the webinars and we received some lovely, um, you can see it in the chat there from Catherine, um, just thanking us for the, for the webinars. Um, Mountains, which is just lovely to read. I'll let you uh, look at that, Steve, uh, when, the, when the webinar's finished. But these these are such fantastic added value, um, these webinars. And especially, I've been really excited about this one because it just feels like we've been taking that first step on the ladder into making uh, pre-lockdown plans a reality. So I just want to thank everybody for their engagement, involvement um, today. Um, and I just think it's your input that makes it vital um, in making these webinars a success. So from my side as moderator today, I'd just like to say thank you. Oh, that's brilliant. Thanks, Jenny. It's been great doing this with you. I'll tell you what I am going to do. I am going to read these out because actually, Jenny, there's only me and you can see these. Um, ah, okay. Yeah. I, I didn't know that myself, but I'm learning as we go. So <laughs> I, d I don't know if you want to read them out or... or, or uh, yeah, them. sure. Can we, uh, uh, Catherine, um, this is such valuable stuff. Thank you, Steve and Jenny. Um, I first met you, Steve, last summer, and it was a similar webinar you delivered that caused me to question why on earth I was receiving such a different service from my then accountants. The move to Inspire was a no-brainer, and I've not looked back. Thank you for looking after us so well which is just absolutely brilliant. Um, and then we've got um, another one from Jonathan, which is a um, fantastic, informative and relevant webinar. Many thanks and well done, Steve and the team. Um, and again, we've got one from, from Joyce who says, uh, super, super webinar, very well done folks. Um, so yeah, all fantastic, great, great to hear. 
great to hear. Oh, that's fantastic. Thanks for that. Thanks for that, Jenny. It makes it makes it worthwhile. And thanks, thanks for you guys. I know um I speak to Joyce and Jenny and um, and Catherine as well on occasion. So look, guys, if you need any of the resources or you want to reach out to us um on any of this, then just 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 fill in that gap and we'll be in touch straight away to see what, what we can help you with. Fantastic. Thank you. For, oh, we just had another one in. Andy says thanks so much. Thanks for that, Andy. Let's <laughs> move on then. I'm going to give you a final parting thought of the day. Um, let's just share this quote. Make a plan today for how to overcome the changes and the challenges you're facing. Commit to at least three actions you will take as a result of today's webinar. Write them down, give each of them an owner and a completion date. And remember, if you need our support, we are here for you. Now, again, if you... If you've been on our webinars before, if you've seen this before, you will um, you will know that we always ask you to make three actions to take three actions. If you'd listened to all of our webinars over the last year, you would now have I don't know how many it is, let's say 30, possibly 40 different actions. If you'd have implemented those, just ask yourself, how different would your business be today and how much more useful would it be to you and your personal goals? Please. Do take the actions. It makes such a massive difference to running a business. It really does. If you don't, if you lose, if you leave this webinar, turn your PC off and go to your inbox or your team and get involved in the day to day, you will undoubtedly lose the value that we shared from you. So that quote, the most successful people see adversity not as a stumbling block, but as a stepping stone to greatness. It simply leaves Jenny and I, so thank you for coming. Thank you for sparing the time with us. We've come in at just under an hour. I hope that's been okay. I'm sure it's your lunchtime coming up so we can all look forward to a bit of lunch. Thanks for your time today. I hope it's been useful and feel free to reach out to us. Thank you. Bye-bye.